This is Time Signatures with Jim Irvin, a podcast and radio program presented by the Capital Area Blues Society in Lansing, Michigan. Most any contemporary musical style can trace its roots back to the blues. Explore the blues and its connections with captivating interviews, lively discussions, and news from the world of the blues. You know I'm crying, crying, baby, up and down this Michigan road, yeah. And now, here he is, your host, Jim Irvin. Baby, I'm well, thank you very much, Parker, and thank you for joining me here on Time Signatures. I'm Jim Irvin, and along with me in studio is our producer, Dedalian, and two well-known Lansing area keyboardists, Mike Scorey and Jim Alfredson both of whom have played in one of the Capital City's longest-running blues bands, the Root Doctor Band. Now, as I mentioned, this is part three of our conversation, and you can listen to the previous installments at lccconnect.org under the Time Signatures podcast webpage. Jim, I'm going to start with you on this one. How would you, how would your previous bandmates describe you and your work ethic? Ooh. Hopefully they'd say that I have a strong work ethic and that I learned the tunes on time. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think I was in my early days probably kind of a taskmaster. Uh, Going back to what Mike was saying about wrong chords and stuff, I would would not hold back if somebody played a wrong chord. Be like, hey, that was wrong. This is what the chord is. And when I was younger, I was probably a little more passive aggressive, so I probably was kind of a jerk about it. Try to be better about that. A little smart aleck. Yeah, a little smart aleck. Because yeah. you know, um, but yeah, I think I think they would say that uh, I have a strong work ethic and um, I'm reliable. I always tell the younger musicians that I I mentor. I'm like, hey man, there's gonna be players out there that are better than you. Always. My dad told me this. He's like, there's never going to be a time when you're the best ever. There's just too many people out there doing it, and. That doesn't matter. What matters is you show up on time, you're pleasant to work with, and you know the material. And you know, I have to be honest, you know, talking to Freddie and James and some of the other people that I've talked to in the Lansing area, I've never heard, I can honestly say, out of of anybody's mouth, a bad word about another musician. Mm -hmm. You just don't hear that. I mean, people, when you get together to jam and play and have a good time, that's exactly what happens. And and we, you work through the, the, the little bumps here and there. We save that for our wives. We, we tell our wives. <laughs> <laughs> that guy. How about you, Mike? What was the question? Lincoln. Lincoln. <laughs> How would your previous bandmates oh. describe you and your work ethic? Yeah, that's pretty strong. I think they would probably on the negative side, they might, uh, I worry about stuff all the time. I'm always worried. So they might talk about that. Um, I don't know. I, I think so. I, I I like to learn new songs, so I'm always if I'm in a band and it's like, guys, are the same songs playing the same songs. Let's learn another song. You know, learn another simple yeah. one if we have to. I don't know, just another one. So, I always push that. Um. Yeah. Okay. I keep expecting the door to open. Have like some former bandmates come in. Oh yeah. And actually like tell me, Hey, <laughs> this is what we this is your life. <laughs> Alfredson, and this is your life. <laughs> Guys, both of you have become well known. I mean, in the greater Lansing area and well beyond for your keyboard work. This is one of my favorite questions that I like to ask a musician. How do you guys balance the public life with the private? I mean, do you find that people feel like they own a part of you because you're a musician? Or? Yeah, I think when I when I came up, things were different. Your gigs were your life, your social life. Sure. In the era, late seventies, eighties, it was, you know, you were at the bar five nights a week, and the bar was packed every night of the week, and then you knew all those, you just knew everybody. My day job has always been involved in sales, one way or the other. I was gonna say you you probably got the most recognition back when you were doing the uh, right the the, the car audio, audio story, yeah. auto I mean that is how I got to know Mike Score right. right there yeah, yeah. and a lot of times it was the same, same. people yeah. yeah you know you're gonna be down at the do drop in tonight yeah you bet let's get those woofers put in for you, okay. <laughs> you know, so literally it was it was like that growing you know but that's that's a that's a really cool way of marketing I mean I fell into it yeah. 
I mean, it did work. It dovetailed. Um, later, I think that's what why I, I don't feel like playing right now. I'm, what you said really early about, well, I had to miss that because I had a gig. I had to miss that because I had to gig. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm looking at now 50 years of playing, and I'm thinking about, I mean, I couldn't go to my cousin's wedding, or I didn't go to, the, I mean, big stuff, Yeah, you yeah. know. I had to leave early f- from my sister's funeral, or, or, or you know, just it was always it was always a, a, like major events, and I. So, <laughs> just, no, I, I don't want to do it anymore. Understand, Jim. Um, believe it or not, I'm kind of an introverted person in general. So wow. For me, it's uh, I think the having a stack of keyboards in front of me is actually like my shield. So when I come off the stage and people want to talk, it's I always have to kind of center myself. I love t- talking to people, especially people that are excited about the music or the organ or something like that. It's usually organ players and Hammond enthusiasts that want to talk. Um, but yeah, my my pre- my public life, my private life, I, I I try not to be different in either of them as a like my personality. I'm probably way more serious when you first meet me and then as we become friends I get goofier and goofier um but the balance is mainly just like trying to uh trying to help people I I get multiple emails and texts and messages a day about ham and stuff from people all over the world because I've worked with a ham organ company as an artist for 15 16 years or something like that so I saw that post you were Actually, doing a video or mm-hmm. something for for him. Yeah, I do demos for him and stuff. And yeah, so I get people calling, you know, not calling, but like contacting me about stuff like that. When a new product is announced, they always come to me like, "What? Do, how much is it? What does it do?" Blah 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 blah. Like, there's only so much I can say. So I try to help people as much as I can and, and talk to them as much as I can. But yeah, it's it's a little difficult sometimes because I'm I'm kind of an introverted person. Okay. You know? How do you guys feel the internet has impacted the music industry? Has it been good? Has it been bad? Has it been somewhere in the middle? It's been both. I mean, you can't really make a living selling music anymore. You have to play live, which is kind of good. Um, at the same time, it's there's so many people making music that it's hard to make a living at it. But that's also a good thing, because I'd rather have people making music than making bombs or something, you know? Like more creativity is not a, ever a bad thing in my mind. More artistic expression is never a bad thing in my mind. The hard part is finding in the niche that you can make a living in and finding the avenue to get to the fans and to get above the signal to noise ratio. But in general, I think it's been a good thing because you can pretty much be your own manager, be your own booking agent, be your own everything. And there's well, a lot of bands that have done that that have been very successful in the last 10, 15 years. And it seems like when I was a kid growing up, you you know, a star would bring out a new CD like every couple of years. Yeah. And now it's like, you know, every six months or every four months or whatever, I mean, they get them in the box and they then they bring them out. And they just keep coming and coming and coming. Well, I think the, the way that things are going now, we're going away from the albums and going back to singles again, which yeah. is what they used to be when the record industry started. You had singles. Mm-hmm. And then you had an album of singles that was a collection and then it turned into like these concept albums and like a you know a cohesive statement was the album now it's getting back to like individual songs which actually i think is a good thing mike yeah you know i don't know i mean it's i guess my first reaction i don't know if it's right or wrong it's it's a generational thing i think you're right yeah i mean i don't i don't know i mean i did what i did and i do what i do and it's usually it's it's very based on you know having somebody right there and especially as I got older, it's even more, you know, if we had a piano right here and 20 people here, I'm good. I mean, that's what I do. And I'm not in the push of my career. I don't need to meet somebody from Florida. I really don't, you know. So it's it's a generational. I don't know. I think overall it's good. I mean, I don't know. How can it not be? But like Jim was saying, it's... Well, it seems like you don't make any money selling a record or even yeah. radio play isn't radio play anymore. It's, right. Right. So you have to, you have to tour in a professional state, yeah. you know? Yep. I think that we've kind of gotten into a, a position of that instant gratification there with like the cross generational stuff. Well, the younger generation seems like they want it now and they're not willing to wait. I don't 
think you can peg them like that. No, I just think it's. it's I, mean, I think they have to wait a long time. A lot of them have to do. It's just it's just a different thing that I'm not. Well, you're twenty years young, at least twenty years younger than me. <laughs> so you know, it's. I don't know. I'm not explaining what I mean, but I don't. I, I don't. You know, they plug away. They put records out. They put music out, not records. They put it out and put it out. Oh, it clicks. Oh, it's on this commercial. Oh, it's on this movie. Oh, oh, they want more. Boom, 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 boom. They're writing more yeah. and more and more. Yeah. Using the internet as a promotional tool has been invaluable. I mean, you can put yeah. something up on YouTube, and the next thing you know, it goes viral. Isn't it crazy? It's great. I mean, especially if you've built up a nice following. Yeah, it's great. We didn't. Uh, like I said, the only downside to me is really just the being able to filter through the signal to noise ratio and find the really, really, really good stuff. I mean, there's more great music out there than ever before. And to get noticed. And to get noticed, yeah. yeah. To, to build up a big enough fan base that you can you can make a living at it, really. It's hard because in the jazz world, and well, in every genre, but in jazz especially, you're not only competing with your contemporaries, you're competing with people that died 30 years ago. Yes. That's, yes. Mm. You know, I'm competing with Jimmy Smith. He's been gone for 10 years as an organ player. I'm competing with Miles Davis. He's been gone for you know, yeah. 30 yeah. years. Yeah. Because those are still great records and people still want to hear that music. I understand it. But then it's like, well, my parents that came up in the 50s and 60s, they weren't, my dad as a guitar player wasn't competing with musicians that lived 50 years ago. Nobody was listening to music from 1900, right? But we're right. still listening to Led Zeppelin. We're still listening to the Beatles. We're well, still yeah, listening. more than just listening into it. I mean, I mean, look at the big, the biggest concert draws. It's the same. It's the Eagles. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. it's, it's amazing. The tribute bands make, make right, money, and the yeah. tribute bands, and that of which I'm a part of, so I can't yeah, speak ill. <laughs> that's it's really that's it seems like that's grown a lot. Like over the last, I don't know, five ten years or so. Like the tribute bands, it seems like they're coming out more and more often. Yeah, it's, oh, it's yeah. huge. Yeah. Well, it seems huge. like the Lansing area's got a lot of that, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, all cities, all cities do. Yeah, I was just—I just saw a keyboard player down in Tampa at the Blues Festival that played with Michael Burks, who's Larry McRae's cousin. That's been gone for about 10, 12 years now. Great keyboard player, and he said, "Man, I'm in a Greg Allman, like Allman Brothers tribute down here in Florida, and he looks like Greg Allman. Wow, hair, you know, plays organ. He's like, man, I made you know twenty four thousand dollars in my last concert, and he's like, I rented out the hall myself, hired the musicians, oh. put up the money myself, but then we made like." Three times what we put in. I'm like, yeah, that's what, that's what you do now with the tribute bands. You know, it well, works. They understand what it's what they're going paying to see. You know, people love it. I mean, yeah. you can't go see Pink Floyd anymore. So what do you do? You go see a Pink Floyd tribute band. There you go. And why not? It's great. I mean, that's you know, in theater they do that a lot. You know, let's revive this one. Let's revive this one. Let's what is classical music? One. I heard classical music described as like the greatest hits of the 1800s. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's kind of, yeah. <laughs> they're still playing yeah. Beethoven and yeah. Mozart and well, Mozart's 1700s, but you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like the same stuff. There's not a lot of, of uh, new material being premiered in classical concert halls across the country, you know, unless you're in a major city. Guys, we're in the home stretch here. I wanted to ask you a couple of questions before we wrap up. What is the single best piece of advice you've received from a fellow musician? And if you can remember who it is, who offered it to you? Um, I've got a bunch of them, but I'll, this one, we've already touched on it from my friend Lisa Smith. She said, "Okay, Mike, if you want to work, three things. Learn the material, show up on time, dress for the gig. If you do that, you're ahead of 90% of the rest of the musicians, mm -hmm. no matter how good they are. I think we touched, that was a good piece of it. And that other one, what Fred said, don't telegraph. <laughs> <laughs> that was a mistake. <laughs> that was a good one. Jim? Uh, probably my father who told me, um, as we just we touched on before too, never get a big head. There's always going to be somebody out there better than you. So be humble, practice your craft, and you'll be fine. And it keeps you hungry too, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, I mean, the part of that that I figured out later that he kind of implied is that as a young man and a young musician, you sometimes see somebody that's really, really good and it deflates you. You're like, oh, I can never do that. But what it should do is inspire you. Because mm. even if you don't ever get to that level, that's something to to strive for, right? It's something to try to achieve. And that's how I think about it now is like, I see people that I see young people that can outplay me night and day, but it's inspiring to me. It doesn't bum me out. It's like, yeah, cool. I want to try to steal a little something from that. 
See, and I, I, I understand that perspective because I'm a photographer and um, I started doing concert photography a couple of years ago and I, that's actually how I got involved with the Capital Area Blues Society. And it's something that I have been told I'm a natural at and I'm very humble about it. I'm very thankful that, that I've got the opportunity to go and do this and, mm-hmm. and shoot some of these acts even though they're local. Um, it's also uh, gotten me an opportunity to shoot with Larry when he's in town and some of the other uh, groups like Brother Earth that we were talking about before we started recording. Um, I just absolutely love that that in, inspiration, I guess. And I always go and look at um, Ken Settle, if you know who Ken Settle is. He's a, a Detroit photographer that's been shooting since Bob was in a bar. Yeah. That's how long he's been shooting Bob Seeger, okay? And I love looking at his pictures because he was shooting back in the film days. Yeah. I can fudge my stuff because it's all digital and right. I can do it on the fly and I don't have to wait, you know, a week to get the film back from New York. Um, so it's 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 fun and I do like to use other photographers to to push my creative juices if you will and yep. and to get better at my craft and in make something that people enjoy but even even with that it's like you know using film versus using digital sometimes it seems like it might be easier to use the new technology which it is sure um but the spark and the inspiration and the talent still has to be there and it's the same thing with this younger generation they grew up with youtube they can go on youtube and find any piece of music they want they can find 10 people playing it they can find 12 different lessons of how to play it yeah Whereas when I was trying to learn how to play like Jimmy Smith, I had to listen to the record, slow it down, try to decode what it was going on, like try to hear through everything. You know what I mean? Yep. Uh, it's a totally different thing. But the the thing about it is that that drive and that inspiration and that creativity and that uh, talent still has to be there. It's still the underlying foundation. It's a great springboard for my last question. And, I'll, and I'm going to start with you. Okay. What is your advice for aspiring musicians? Um, I would say, getting back to what we've talked about numerous times, be on time, <laughs> learn the material, and dress for the gig, and have a humble attitude, and of course, practice. Nothing beats practice. You just have to put the hours in. There's no shortcuts. I don't care how talented you are, you're eventually going to hit a wall, and you need to just keep playing and keep practicing. But attitude, learning the material, Showing up on time, those are the three most important things. Mike, how about you? I get to, to keep it on music. I I would just say keep learning songs. You learn a song, learn another one, learn another one, learn another one. You know, I mean, for somebody young, I mean, you can examine what you want. Well, you want to really learn what learn what separates this from that and study this. I think for somebody young, it's just just learn another song and try to even if you think you're not a singer. Um, try to try to mimic the melody as best you can. Um, I think that I, I wish I would have done more of that when I was younger, but I didn't. Just if you're not a singer, pretend you are. Learn that melody. Hum it if you can't. If you can't, you know. If you, it's hard to be a singer, but hum it. Do whatever you got to do. Whistle it to memorize the melody. Then learn another one. Memorize it. Yep. That's what I would tell them. Fake it till you make it. Yeah. Yeah. Take it until you, you make, make it. it. Well, I mean, you know, if you, yeah. You, There's some truth to that for sure. It's about. Yeah. Learn, yeah, yeah. I mean, my first gig, man, I, I, oof. I remember it was with that country band, like, that I played with in Mason. Oh. And they're playing all these, like, country tunes. I didn't know these tunes. All these, like, classic rock tunes, Eagles tunes and stuff. I was like, man, I was listening to, the, like, Jimmy Smith and stuff. I wasn't listening to this stuff. <laughs> but you just kind of go in and, yeah, I can do this. Yeah. Make, it, make it until you make it, and you'll learn a lot. Well, Mike, Jim, it has been such an honor to sit with you guys and talk about, just talk about everything related to, to the music and the blues and the history that you guys have. It's it's so much fun, and I'm one of these people. I, I mean, time signatures, of course, you understand the, 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 uh, the time signatures portion of it as far as wh- how it relates to music, but... I think you guys have definitely put your signature on your time 
that you've done as musicians. Thank and you. I certainly look forward to a lot more in the future from both of you, including Mr. Alfredson. Oh. Family Business, the yes. recently re released uh, CD. Yes. So this is my first CD on a label that's not my own label. Okay. Under my own name. This is on the Positone label out of L.A. Recorded in Brooklyn, New York in 2021 and featuring a cast of stellar New York musicians and some local guys like Diego Rivera. Well, Diego's down in Austin now, but he was at Michigan State for years. I am really excited to give this a listen. Yeah. I, I can't, and I'm one of those people, I think, you, was it you that was talking about your dad's eclectic yes. music taste? Yeah. Very much the same. I yeah. got everything from big band to gospel. You'll dig it, man. Everything this is like between. classic Hammond organ jazz. I mean, it's just like, yeah. yeah. You got a Absolutely. website or anything you want to give a mention? Jamalfordson.com. And uh, if you're looking for the, the CD itself or the album downloads, just go to Positone. Okay. You'll find it. Uh, Mike? Any website you want to promote? Or Retired.com. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I'm not pushing it. I, I know I got Go nothing. see him at Music Manor yeah. for crying Stop out loud. Stop it at Music yeah. Manor. Uh, yes. yeah. Just don't do it on a Friday because he won't be there. 3333 three, 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 <laughs> South Cedar. <laughs> Thank you all Thank once you. again for being here. We really enjoyed having you guys. And, uh, man, I, I'll bet we could sit here and talk for another hour, but y'all need to get home. I know. We didn't get into the good stuff. Isn't that crazy? I, know. <laughs> I mean, there's there's possibilities coming back again. You know, we've already got... I we we have, have a whole segment on the weirdest places. I think oh, we have a, oh. we have enough material, Ooh. I think, for three episodes. So okay. there you go. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, that's going to wrap it up for us this time. We appreciate y'all being here. Make sure you uh, check us out at lccconnect.com. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time on Time Signatures. This has been Time Signatures with Jim Irvin, presented by the Capital Area Blues Society in Lansing, Michigan. For more information on cabs, visit capitalareablues.org. You can find this episode and past episodes at lccconnect.org. The Time Signatures theme song, Michigan Roads, is used by permission and was written by Root Doctor, featuring Freddie Cunningham. You know I'm fine, fine, baby, driving up in Until next time, keep on keeping the blues alive. Baby, I'm